All right, time for the entirely oversimplified yet totally sufficient history of atomic structure. Now, we did these timelines in class, and you had to make and fill out these tables about the history of atomic structure in class, but I saw a lot of mistakes on them. So I'm, I'm putting this video up so you can go back through, figure this stuff out because I'm not teaching it in class. We just don't have the time, especially with the snow day or days that we have coming up. So let's take a look at it. And really, dates aren't so much as important as it is people and what they did. You gotta know the, uh, the people, the particles, the laws, the theories, the models, the experiments, and stuff like that. So the whole thing starts in 460 BC, 5th century BC, with Democritus. Democritus is the first person to suggest that atoms exist. He's the first person that came up with the idea of an atom. His idea was simple. Take a piece of lead, cut it in half. Take one of those halves and cut it in half. Take one of those halves and cut it in half. You keep getting smaller and smaller pieces of lead. He came up with this idea that you would reach a point where it was so small that if you cut it in half again, it wouldn't be lead anymore. You would have an atomos of lead, which is Greek for atom. You have an atom of lead. And if you split that atom in half, it wouldn't be led anymore. And despite the fact that he's the fifth century BC, it was that long ago, that idea is really correct. That is what atoms are. It's the smallest particle of an element you can have. If you break it down any further, then it's no longer that element anymore. So that's Democritus. He's the one that starts it all. Now this timeline that I'm using, this is a, a simplified one I used in classes before, does not include Lavoisier and Proust. They fit in this segment in here in 1774 in France we have Lavoisier and his idea was the law of conservation of mass What he did is experiments with chemical changes, and what he noticed is that the mass of the reactants was always the same as the mass of the products. So if you started with a candle in a jar, unlit, just in a jar, and its mass was, I don't know, 35 grams. You could light that candle, let that candle burn down. As long as it stayed in the jar and you captured all the gases that came off that candle, the candle might look smaller, there might be less candle there, but if you account for the mass of all the gases that are produced as well, it would still be 35 grams. There would be no change in mass. He fits in here right after Democritus. In 1799, also in France, we have Proust. And Proust writes the law of constant composition. What he did is he did chemical reactions on compounds and broke them back down into elements again. So for example, he took carbon dioxide. He could break it down into carbon and oxygen. He took water. He could break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. And what he found is no matter where that carbon dioxide came from, it was also always the same ratio of carbon and oxygen by mass. Wherever that water came from, didn't matter where that water came from. When he broke it down, it was always the same ratio of hydrogen to oxygen by mass. That whole, when we talk about percent composition thing, the percent composition was the same no matter where that water came from. That was Proust's contribution. Now, both these take place in France, and here's a little interesting cross-curricular thing. Notice we go from France to England with Dalton and Thomson and Rutherford. These people all worked in England. The switch was the cause of the French Revolution. When these guys were doing their science, they were funded by the monarchy of France. When the French Revolution happened, they ended up in jail. Um, some of them ended up losing their heads for it. And that was the end of the, the French contribution, so to speak, as the revolution took place. People were more worried about survival than they were about science. So from there, it moved on into England, and we see a lot of development taking place in England instead. Picks up with Dalton, 1808. What he does is the first atomic theory. He doesn't know what atoms are, and that's the interesting part here. 
But what he does is he takes all these ideas that came before him and he puts them together into what are four major points in his atomic theory. First of all, all matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms. Basically, Democritus' idea there. The second idea is that uh, atoms of an element are identical and different from every other element. In other words, if you had a sample of gold atoms, you had a mole of gold, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold. What he's saying here is that all the gold atoms would be the same. But those gold atoms would be different from every other gold atom. So an really, uh, interesting idea. He's also saying they're different from every other atom of every other element. So if you had a mole of silver atoms, all those silver atoms would be identical. But they would be different from every other element. So it would be different from the gold atoms. All the gold atoms are the same. All the silver atoms are the same. But they're different from one another. That's what he's getting to there. The third thing, the third point, atoms combine in fixed ratios to produce compounds. This is what good old Proust was doing here. This constant composition idea. He's talking about how the atoms of an of the elements, I should say, because Proust wasn't talking about atoms. The elements are always combined together in the same ratio. So you always have the same ratio by mass of carbon to oxygen and carbon dioxide. What Dalton's saying was that's because you have the same elements. You have the same atoms combining in the same ratio. So I mean, that's Democritus' idea. That is Proust's idea. Fourth and final thing he says is that atoms are not created or destroyed in chemical reactions. They're rearranged. That's Lavoisier's idea in action. He's just applying the idea of atoms to it. So really, of these four things, only the second one is really his idea. This idea that atoms of an element are identical but different from other elements. When he says matter is composed of atoms, Democritus had already come up with that idea. When he says atoms combine in fixed ratios to make compounds, that's Proust's idea, constant composition. The ratios by mass were the same because the atoms and their ratios were the same. And then atoms can't be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. That's just building on Lavoisier, who says mass cannot be created or destroyed. Well, the reason why mass can't be created or destroyed is because atoms can't be created or destroyed. So again, that idea here about elements of an, uh, atoms of an element being the same but different from every other element, that's his big contribution to all of this. Now, he had no idea what atoms were. We don't get anything on that front until J.J. Thompson comes along in 1876. He's working with cathode ray tubes. It's a glass tube, electrodes at both ends, beam shoots down the middle. He's trying to figure out what the beam was made of. So he does some experiments with it, with electrical fields around it to see how it reacts to the electrical fields. He puts paddle wheels inside to see what it does to the paddle wheels. He comes up with this idea that those, that beam is matter and it's a part of an atom. And that part of the atom is the electron. That's what he discovers. He discovers the electron. It's the first piece of the atomic puzzle. Now, it gives us the ability to go back to what Dalton's saying here and try to get some more detail in it. So we can start thinking about what an atom is. And that's where he comes up with the plum pudding model of the atom. This idea that you have this massless cloud of positive charge, 
with the electrons scattered around through it. Now, it was named after plum pudding because the idea was in, in a plum pudding, you've got this bread. This bread is the massless cloud of positive charge. You've got these raisins or prunes in it, these, these dried up plums. And those would be the electrons scattered through it. Best way to think about that is the chocolate chip cookie model, where the cookie is the massless cloud of positive charge and the chocolate chips are the electrons scattered through it. There is only one particle because that's all he knows, electrons. This is attempt at explaining what an atom was. In 1911, we get the next, get some pieces of information from Ernest Rutherford. He's doing the gold foil experiment, radioactive source, shooting radioactive particles at a thin piece of gold foil. He knows most went straight through that most went through the gold foil like there was nothing there. Some deflected off in different directions. Something had bent them or changed their path, while fewer still bounced right off of it. <clears throat> Based on those observations, he came up with the idea of the nucleus, this thing that was, they were bouncing off of, these particles were bouncing off of, had to be something that had a relatively large mass, but was relatively small because not many of them bounced off. So this small, massive object, the center of the atom, called that the nucleus. This deflection here had to do with the nucleus charge. He knew these particles that he was shooting at it were positive, and what he theorized is that they were being repelled by positive charge. So that nucleus that he discovered must have a positive charge, meaning it must contain a positive particle. He called it the proton. So Rutherford discovers the proton, and the nucleus when he does his gold foil experiment. The nucleus is this compact mass of center of the atom and it contains these positive particles called protons. He just ideally thought that this must work kind of like a solar system with these electrons, which were negative, according to Thompson, orbiting that nucleus. Called it a planetary model. So big, big change from the plum pudding to the planetary. So you've got a little solar system, instead of a sun in the middle, there's a nucleus in the middle. Instead of planets orbiting it, you've got electrons orbiting it. Instead of gravity holding the whole thing together, it's opposite charge. Negative electrons being attracted to a positive nucleus. Next up, and the dates vary in, the, in some of the things I've researched. It puts um, Chadwick at 1932 and it put Neil Bohr and his work at 1922. And this one here is talking about 1940s, you know, whatever. As long as you know what they did, that's what's more important. James Chadwick fixed a problem with this model. When Rutherford came up with a model, he stuck all these nucleus, these protons together in the nucleus, and these protons have a positive charge, and like charged objects repel each other. So all these positive charges shouldn't be there together. They should be repelling each other. So there has to be something in there that's stopping them from repelling. The second big issue with this is that the masses didn't work. When he took his model and he tried to predict the mass of elements, it was always less than what they really were, by about half. So there had to be something else in there. Chadwick discovers something else. He discovers neutrons, the other particle that's found in the nucleus, the neutral particle that's found in the nucleus. A little trivia, Jimmy Neutrons, named after James Chadwick. The, a nickname, a very common nickname for James is Jimmy. Jimmy discovered the neutron and that's where the whole name came from. That might help you remember it. So it's, I guess it's more than just trivia. It'll help you remember stuff for the test. Finally, last person on this timeline, again, kind of comes here on some timelines when you look at them online, when you, when you try to research this stuff, sometimes comes after Niels Bohr. Another problem with this model is that orbiting bodies eventually crash into whatever they're going to orbit. But these electrons never crash into the nucleus, so they can't be just orbiting it. There has to be something different about it. He uses line spectra, which we'll talk a little bit about in class because it's important. And, and based on this line, spectra comes up with this idea that the electron cloud, this outer part, is not just a willy-nilly electrons orbiting the nucleus thing. But the electrons have to exist at very discrete distances from the nucleus. 
they have this is the nucleus it has to be here here or here it can't be anywhere in between he called these discrete distances energy levels basically he comes up with the idea of dividing up the electron cloud the outer part of the atom into energy levels that's his big thing so what do you need to know Democritus, first person that came up with the idea of the atom. Lavoisier is the person that comes up with the law of conservation of mass. The mass in a chemical reaction never changes. The mass of the reactants and products are always the same. Proust's law of constant composition. The ratio of elements by mass is always the same in a compound no matter where it comes from. So if you took carbon dioxide that you exhaled versus carbon dioxide from dry ice versus carbon dioxide from burning something, and you did the percent compositions, the answers would be the same no matter what. The percent of carbon would always be the same no matter where it's from. The percent of oxygen would always be the same no matter where it's from. That's his idea. Dalton comes up with atomic theory. The first atomic theory takes the ideas of Democritus and um, Lavoisier and Proust and combines them together with some of his own ideas into the first uniform theory of what atoms are. He's considered the father of modern chemistry for that reason. It changes the focus of chemistry towards atoms, which is where it's stayed ever since. Know the points of his atomic theory. Thompson does the cathode ray tube experiment. In that experiment, discovers the electrons, the negatively charged subatomic particle, very small one, as we're going to learn. Based on that, it comes up with the plum pudding model of the atom. Rutherford, doing the gold foil experiment, discovers the nucleus of the atom, the small, densely packed cluster in the center where most of the mass is. And in that nucleus, he says there are protons, positively charged particles. Those are his two biggest discoveries, the protons and the fact that there's a nucleus in an atom. And on to Chadwick, does the same gold foil experiment, by the way. He's actually just using Rutherford's experimental data. He was a graduate student of Rutherford's. So same experiment, but in that experiment figures out the neutron idea. The other particle that's in the nucleus ends up being equal in size to the protons, but it has no charge. And then finally, Niels Bohr. Kind of changes the way we look at that electron cloud, that outside of the atom. No longer do they orbit, but they exist within energy levels. It divides the electron cloud up into energy levels, these discrete distances from the nucleus where those electrons have to exist. So go back to that, that, that table sheet that I'm going to give you back. Fix the stuff you need to fix. The biggest things are what they discovered when it comes to Thompson, um, Rutherford, Chadwick and Bohr. Those four people, there were a lot of mistakes on the timelines in terms of what they did, what they discovered. I saw a few of you that left off the fourth point. It was on a separate slide. You just had to look at the next slide down to find point four, but a lot of you didn't have point four on there, so make sure you got it. Fix it, study it. This is what you're going to be quizzed on.